Hello and welcome back to the IVF Daddies podcast. Today I'm with a wonderful friend of mine, Robin, who very luckily for us flew in to London to spend the weekend with her son and I've stolen some of her time. So Robin, welcome to London. Thank you, Richard. And nice to meet you, IVF Daddies. It's lovely to have you on. So we've known each other now for a while. Mm -hmm. You own and run Beverly Hills Egg Donation, mm -hmm. or BHED as I always call it. We've been working together with many different intended parents over the years. And I just want to understand a little bit more about the motivations that you had in working for the agency, given your background, because for those of you that don't know, we have a lawyer in the room, never practices law, but has a law degree, a 30 year insurance expert, and then you ended up in eggs. That's a big transition. Yes, it is. Admittedly, your husband worked in the IVF field, so I think it wasn't all new. I always look at you as one of the grand arms of the egg donor industry and, and so well respected and loved. Yeah. So tell us a little bit more about you. I started in eggs 12 years ago, although I've been married to an IVF doctor for 40 years at this point. So I've been hearing about the whole industry as it was growing up. We got married in New York and he he actually did the first egg donors in New York probably about 35 years ago wow. when he was working in academics. So fast forward, I had 30 years in the insurance business. I was traveling. I was a risk management underwriter. I was a risk management manager. I was just going to take early retirement as soon as I could. <laughs> <laughs> I want out. <laughs> I want out and I want out now. But I knew I was, I knew there was going to be a second act. And the woman who actually started BHED was transitioning to another field. And my husband told me about it. I bought the agency, doubled it in size, then quadrupled it in size, brought all my friends to work with me, brought some family to work with me. And I have a very loyal and seasoned group of professionals that have been doing this at least 10 years at this point. We travel the world together. We travel the country together. And we have, we have thousands of babies at this point. So it's, it's uh, definitely a tight knit group of, of people that you work with. And it is. I know it's I've known a lot of them for a long time now. I think probably one of the first egg donation agencies I came across. So for me, it's really wonderful to have you here and, and to be interviewing you. One of the questions that, that I would love is how do you differentiate what you do to some of the other agencies? We're different on a lot of levels. And some of it has to do with the fact that it's, this is not a regulated industry. And I come from such a regulated background of insurance the law is very regulated, even though I don't practice law. And, and also my background growing up, I had very strict parents. So I feel like I've been regulated since day one. One of the things that we did to differentiate ourselves is to make us contractually easy to use. So we have a 75% refund policy up until the day the donor starts injectable medication. So if you, as the intended parent, walks away for any reason, there's no question ask refund policy. That's, and what do you mean by injectable medication? When the donor starts, the medi after, the, after legal clearance, the donor will start medications for the injections for your cycle. So okay. the timeline to get to the injectable medication is about two months for medical clearance and legal clearance. And then the donor takes injections for two to three weeks to get to the egg retrieval. So there's a rather long period of time of which you can cancel and get a refund, which Amazing. is different than everybody else to start with. The other thing we do that's, I believe we're the only one in the field that does this, if you do not have any, if you do not have a take home baby at the end of this process, you can have a, another cycle with no agency fee. So the agency fee is waived. You would have to pay a donor fee, but no agency fee. So to the best of my knowledge, we're the only one wow. in the uh, industry that does this. And the point is to make this as easy of an experience as possible. I know there's a lot of moving parts. I know there's, and that's just the egg donation, not just, including the surrogacy. So we're trying to make this as user-friendly as possible. And that, I always remember going through this and, and one of my, one of the concerns, there were multiple, just because I'm a worry wart, but there were multiple concerns was what's going to happen if I don't have a baby and I've spent all this money. So you've got that guarantee right. that if, right. if it's all gone wrong and you don't have a baby, you can start again. And, you can and start just, again. You're not going to pay me. We'll yeah, still have to pay, to pay the donor the fees, because the donor is going through an invasive procedure. But it, it's from my standpoint, we will just exactly. power you through this and, and get you to the finish line. Wow. And I know that you are having given your 
insurance background and your legal mm-hmm. background. We've had wonderful conversations about certain things and you're very data driven in looking at trends around mm-hmm. egg donors. And it's a real passion of yours to almost understand why people are choosing donors. So can you give me a, like more information on that? Because I find that fascinating right. as well. Right. Talk, talk to me through that. It's, part, it's partly because I'm data driven. It's partly because I'm a mom. It's partly because I've worked my whole life, but I hate to waste time. So I've looked to see what really, what you have to get through to get the donors into the cycle of first time donor or even a repeat donor. So the first thing we do is we give them in their pre-screen, the FDA screening, that's the Food and Drug Administration. They have to be able to successfully answer 20 questions before they can even jump to the next stage of the process. And and what do those questions entail roughly? They have to do with travel to Zika zones, which will throw them out of, things that will throw them out of the doctor's office pretty much immediately. Travel to Zika zones. Zika is a virus. Zika is a virus that is based on the Center for Disease Control. I'm sorry for rolling my eyes, but it's something that plagues me. Well, because technically, me. I know Plague, technically right. some of the United States is a Zika zone. Now, the U.S. doesn't have Zika zones, but the Caribbean, based on any moment in time, could be a Zika zone. Latin America could be a Zika zone. Southeast Asia could be a Zika zone. India wow. could be a Zika zone. And, and so if you've been the to Philippines, that right. country, you are... Excluded. You have to be sidelined for six months. Okay, okay. you can right. six months. Six months. Wait and right. come back. So that's not somebody we can work with right away. Wow. But so that's whole... one thing. So that's really interesting that the FDA can control what a lot. you're they, doing. They control everything. And they control everything. And so a question around the Zika zone thing then mm-hmm. is, I've selected a donor. She decides to go on holiday, mm-hmm. and she goes to one of those countries that is in inverted commas a Zika country. Mm-hmm. What then? She's basically put on the sidelines for six months. And if you're the intended parent, you get really unhappy with me and with the donor. So we do clear them in advance and make them request that they delay any travel to Cabo San Lucas or any fun place that they want to go to that's in the Zika zone. And so that's almost part of the education around the egg donors and the process that you're doing. Correct. Okay. So that's part of our initial application. It's also reconfirmed in the interview and then it's reconfirmed when we match the donors with intended parents that there's no there has been no travel and there's no travel anticipated but that is a big thing with college students and with graduate students and and so what other screenings are you doing okay besides the fda application which is much more than the zika it, it includes a lot of very detailed questions there are several other areas that we look at that that again are trends of what gets you thrown out of the doctor's office before you can start the process um, the other things that get you thrown out of the doctor's office are having a STD, sexually transmitted diseases. Um, that puts you on the sides of the sidelines for a year after treatment. Um, a year after treatment? Treatment, after, after it's been cleared. So, um, Is it STD dependent? For example, can you donate if you have HIV, for example? And that hasn't come up yet. So I, it hasn't come up yet. I, I would, I would doubt it. I would, I will find that out, but that has not come up in 12 years. Okay. But so, so something right. like gonorrhea, chlamydia, chlamydia syphilis. Right. Those have all come up. Once they're cleared, they have to be, wait a year to be in Wait a donor. year. Right. And again, if you're the intended parent, you're going to be a bit grumpy. Correct. And the, the whole goal is not to have grumpy parents. Okay? Save time and not have right. grumpy right. people. Exactly. Get people powered through the process successfully. Get the donors and the parents powered through. The next thing that comes up are um, pap smears that haven't been done or are not clear. So we make, before the donors get on our website, we have them have STD tests. We send them to the gynecologist for pap smears. They have to clear the FDA application. And then there's one more thing that they have to clear. We send them for a blood test for something called anti-malarian hormone, AMH, to see if they have a good ovarian reserve and that there will be good candidates for fertility. And so that you do before they even get to a doctor. So you're in effect sending them. Correct. And if the number comes back good or bad? We we lose about 10% of these young girls due to low AMH. We cannot put them on our website. We cannot send them to a doctor's office. And at this point, we advise them what their AMH is. And we tell them to go freeze their eggs now for their own future use. So I consider that a public service. I do not know to this day why the doctors don't send 22-year-old girls for this screening. To me, it beggars belief that you have a whole cohort of women 
that don't know about their own fertility. They don't. And it just, I don't understand it. No. But so you are Correct. proactively Correct. testing. Correct. And, and then if these women don't have a high enough AMH, you're saying go and freeze right. your eggs. Right. You're actually educating we them. We are educating them. And I, again, I feel like it's a public service that's not being addressed by the medical community. Say you have a donor that has done a cycle before, she can present to you mm -hmm. her previous mm -hmm. medical records mm -hmm. and you would look through that. How does that work if, for example, she's done more than one cycle, an mm -hmm. IVF cycle right. and has donated right. Right. and some are good and some are not so good. And what would you classify as good, not so good, great fertility, not for, explain a little bit more about uh, that if you can. Again, I'm not, I don't have a medical background myself, so I rely on what I hear from the doctors that I work with. And generally speaking, the standard for what a good cycle is, I would say is uh, 15 eggs. Okay. Anybody who's got five eggs as a result of taking all those fertility drugs is probably not going to be approved by another doctor. And we, sometimes we see donors who have like tremendous egg counts, but that doesn't mean they're all good eggs. Sometimes you can see somebody with 50 eggs and that sounds all great, but then maybe 30 of them are mature and maybe there's 15 embryos of which five are PGD normal. And you say, that's not a good result. Okay. Just the egg count alone is not a good result. So we try to get as much information as we can. The problem is that when you're working with donors that are coming from other agencies or other clinics, you don't always get a full picture because the donors are only really entitled to the egg count. Oh, okay. Unless it's in their legal contract that they're in, in, entitled to pregnancy information or embryo and PGD information. So you have to do a bit we of have to, private uh, investigation. Yes, yes, we have to. And the doctors, we're sending the doctor, the donor back to the same clinic that she's worked with before. We'll know what the results were, whether we know it or not. Yeah. I don't know if what I did is what other people would do. Mm -hmm. We looked for an egg donor that looked very similar to a family member so mm -hmm. that there would be some form of resemblance. Right. In your daily life, what are you seeing? I see so many different things that all I do is ask a lot of questions. Like you, I would think they would want somebody that would look like their sister, cousin, some family re resemblance. But as often as I would think it, I, I do get a number of requests for things that are totally different. What's than, the most common request, what do you say? The most common request, and don't laugh at me, is a woman I would have dated if I was straight. Okay? I, I get okay? that. I get that. I <laughs> Walk into a bar, who would I be looking okay. at? Okay. I said, and I said, I'm from New York. You can, you can tell me anything. Do you get people ask about height? Yes. Ethnicity? Yes. What other questions do people ask you about? Uh, musically, musical abilities, um, sports abilities, academic abilities. We had somebody who wanted a bow-legged donor. I don't know, but okay, we had well, one. Well, there we go. So. There we go. And Maybe they like horse riding. I don't, I, mean, <laughs> I don't, I, I ask questions, but I don't probe into why that might be. <laughs> and then I had uh, European donors who wanted uh, a donor from Central America because their family members adopted children from Central America and they wanted all the kids to look like. So that's why I ask questions because I don't know the answers. I don't know what people are looking for. And people have their own reasons for... Do people ever come to you and say, I want specific eye color, nose size, ear shape? Do you get that? I get it all the time. So to some extent, even the doctors will say you're trying to make designer babies. But the truth of the matter, you've got, you've got the male source and you have the female source. Right. So it just doesn't, you can have all of these things in your egg donor and you still have your own genes to contend with. Some of the movie stars who married models and the kids look like the dads. Okay. They don't look, <laughs> <laughs> they didn't I don't want to name names, but I can do that. Right. Good genes, well, they didn't They didn't get the model genes. They got half the model genes and it just didn't show up in the kids that way. So yeah. it's amusing. Do you ask people about things like plastic surgery? We do. Yeah. And yeah. natural hair color. And do you get a lot of people that apply that didn't, don't look now like they would have looked? Yes, including myself, but <laughs> I have very dark brown curly hair. So you see what California <laughs> did to me. And, and photographs. I remember I did actually ask uh, for photographs of the donor and her family and siblings and all those different things just to get a, an all round picture. But what about things like videos and do you facilitate calls? Yes, we have videos available. If intended parents want to have a Zoom call with the donor, that's fine. If they want to meet for lunch in Los Angeles or San Diego, we can arrange that as well. Or New York. And how do you counsel both parties when they are meeting for the first time? 
I try to share as much. We have a very long donor interview process, so I will share that information with the intended parents. But they usually have something on their mind that they want to talk to the donor about. And as far as counseling the donors, I'll tell you, I have some had some really strange meetings, and I, I say to the donors, it's a, think of it as a strange job interview. Okay, it's like a date, but it's like a job interview, and it's you have to think about really what your future contact's going to be with with the intended parents. I said, if it's too weird, just pull your ear and I'll jump in and diffuse the situation. I love that. I love the fact that you are almost sitting there next to the donor or with the donor and saying, I'm here. I've got your back. If this is uncomfortable, let me know. And and that that feeling, that must, for the donors, do they ever come back to you and say, oh my God, that thank you for that? Or how did the donors react and interact with you pre, during, post? They They know that we're here for them and we do facilitate all of the meetings regardless of where they are. I'll do introductions and I'll do a closing and if I see there's any strangeness going on or we have our little signals, I'll be jumping right in to diffuse or change the subject and I'll just take it offline with whoever needs to be spoken to at that point. Which is amazing because these are generally younger women. They're generally younger. They're generally between 21 and 29 although we have them up to age 34, uh, but never below 21. We just think that's too young to be working with them. Oh, why do you think it's too young? As a mom of three boys, I'll tell you, 21 is, it's young. There's, it's a, there ha, there's a certain gravitas to the process that they have to be able to follow instructions and they have to be reliable. And 25 is really my sweet spot mentally on, a, on how old a donor should be to do this. It's personal. Sorry. Yeah. I'm the boss. I, and you're the boss. And that, <laughs> the but, boss. They, but these are things right. that, that these, for me, these are right. really important right. things right. because again, coming back to the trends, coming back right. to right. an industry where as professionals, we need to look after and mentor right. and right. really be there psychologically for people right. because right. there are questions they don't know they need to ask. And there are answers we need to give them to those questions before they even start. At the very beginning of the process, the donors do go through a psychological review with a psychologist that we work with. There's a a test called a personality assessment test, and then they have an interview afterwards. We also do update the psychology results every year. Um, In the case, you know, if somebody has done a donation a long time ago and it was anonymous and they want to kind of change where they are with the donor, we'll make both the intended, we'll make, we'll request both the intended parents and the donor to go through another psychological review, each separately and then one together. So that we're, you know, again, just keeping everybody walking along the same line. I have an open donation. So my egg donor at some stage probably will be contacted by the Mm -hmm. children or vice versa. How has that changed historically? It's changed 180 degrees. When I started in eggs 12 years ago, every, almost everything was anonymous, okay? It was over time and over Ancestry.com and 23andMe, the thought of anonymity was just getting stranger and stranger because you just couldn't protect anybody's anonymity. Anybody with a social media presence can be found. In situations where, say, for example, my donor had been anonymous mm-hmm. and I find her, We've changed contracts. After the fact? After the fact. Wow. That's why I went to law school, because to do contracts, really. This is what I love when there are people that have been in this industry and seen the changes right. and proactively right. are saying, okay, this is happening. Right. What can we do to both protect the intended parents right. and, and donor. the donor? Right. Right make sure that everybody again is on the same page. But I didn't realize you could change a contract. I think when we're doing this contract, this contract, I shouldn't say revision, it's an addendum to the contract that both the donor and the intended, but both, excuse me, both the donor and the parents are both being protected. That's the whole point to allow for happiness ever after, still with guidelines. And I really personally turned off by anonymous situations. Even back in in the day, I always thought that the uh, child should be able to contact the donor if they want to. So I guess it also comes back in my mind to why they're doing this donation in the first place. And money is obviously part and parcel of what they're doing, but it's more than that. 
I would say most of the donors are doing it for altru even though they're getting paid, they're doing it for altruistic reasons. If you saw in our application, we were asking them what they're interested in, what kind of extracurricular activities they're doing. They're very community-minded. They're very out there. They may not want to have families of their own, or they may have friends who have struggled with fertility issues. Uh, we also have a fair amount of donors in the LGBTQ space, and they want to help their brothers. So there you go. Amazing. And I love that. I think it, understanding motivations, right. again, you're asking questions of the intended parents and you're asking questions of the donors and you're really matching them up right. from a, a realistic expectation right. perspective. And that, that's really phenomenal because I do remember when I was thinking about mm -hmm. donation, mm -hmm. thinking, okay, this is a lot of money mm -hmm. that I'm paying across and why are they doing this? And I think that was one of, because we had a conversation, it was like, tell us more. Right, right. What is the range? How does that even, how do you come up with a number, for example? The range is pretty wild, so I'll start from the beginning on this. The first-time donors get a donor fee of $10,000. Generally speaking, the previous donors get a donor fee of $12,000, generally speaking. I'm not the low end of the scale, and I'm nowhere near the high end of the scale. There are people who get a lot more money, even through BHED, and for some interesting reasons. There are some Ethnicities that are underrepresented in the egg donor pool, they tend to get higher fees. Which You'd be surprised. Think about the, the two largest populations in the world. And Chinese and Indian egg donors are, East Indian egg donors are underrepresented in the donor population. Why is that? Cultural, maybe. Wow. Okay, I didn't realize okay. that. Okay. So that's one thing. There are donors with very high academics from Ivy League schools. Their donor fees are six figures and all. Yeah. I mean... Yeah, no, and, I've, I, and I've, I'm on the low end of the six figures when it happens, so I've heard of first-time donors making in excess of half a million dollars, and I don't do that. Okay, it's, again, it's a lot of the, the East Coast Ivy League donors. I like educated donors. I like grad students. I like post-grad students, donors, and, but it's, I, legally, I can't set donor fees, so that's an interesting conundrum. There was a class action suit against... So so you if know, you're not industry? allowed to set the fees, who does set the fee? Are we, you, we just you confirm guide? the fees with them. We, we guide them and confirm them. But if a donor has in their mind that they want $25,000, that's the number we'll give the intended parents. And then if... I, I don't like negotiating with donors yeah. because they're going through an invasive process. They're taking medication. They're going through... They're under anesthesia. It's not without its own risks to them Yeah. in that respect. So... And if they feel that, I, I have a feel for what's going on in the industry, you know, I'll, I'll do the best I can for both parties. That's amazing. I'm, I, I mean, and again, these are amazing human beings that are doing something right. very altruistic. Right. It is. It's fantastic. If you have perfect test scores and you're from Harvard or Yale, it's just, you'll... You'll be able to command a high compensation. You'll, yes, but it's taxable. Okay. Oh, it's oh, all okay. taxable. Oh my gosh. Well, of course, of course it is. So how does that work? They have to file it with their taxes as income. So it's interesting that I'm just thinking if I send my daughter to Harvard, no, no different story. That's, that's about 10, 15 years from now. Obviously, BHD is based in Beverly Hills. It's right. a California right. company. Correct. Do you have donors that are flying into the United States from other countries? Are you just the United States? Tell me a little bit more about where you, your donor pool comes from. My donor pool comes from the United States. They're all legally able to work in the U.S. or residents of the U.S. So you could have, I don't use international students or people who are flying in from outside the country unless they're legally able to work in the U.S., which the U.S. is pretty strict on. Strict on that. So you don't, you wouldn't fly a donor in from, I don't know, no. say Sweden to... Nowhere. No. And where would you say most of your donors are based? Two thirds of them are between Santa Barbara and San Diego in Southern California. So okay. we have a pretty big catchment in the Southern California area and a third of them are spread countrywide in the US. We have a, a, I have an office in Boston and a person who works in Boston. So we have a fair amount of donors in that area also. You're targeting Harvard, aren't you? All of the schools in Boston are good. So it's just, a, I think there's 125,000 students in Boston. So Crikey. Yeah, and it's a young city. <laughs> yeah. And percentage wise, coming back to data, because I'm a bit of a data geek, what percentage of people that apply make it through to being a successful egg donor on average? I'd say maybe 10 to 15%. 
that's quite a high attrition rate. That's from people who apply. Again, we're losing people at the initial FDA application. We're losing them on the AMH, the on the AMH, STD, and Pap smear. And we're also losing them because they have pretty strict standards on education, age, BMI. So they have Why to add BMI? In. Because the higher the BMI, the more um, fertility drugs you have to take to produce the eggs. Oh, okay. And it was, it was just a suggestion from some from of our medical advisors. Yeah, so we're looking for BMIs of 25 and less. Okay. But generally over 20, because if your BMI is too low, it could, it could have other issues attached to that. Yeah. So again, we're looking for college students, college grads, grad students. I'm not looking for people who didn't go to college. So that takes people off the scale pretty quickly also. That's why I say we get a lot of applications, but we don't. You don't. We don't. End up with all of them right, on your database. Right, correct. And how we will have a link to your database sure, here great. in, in the, uh, the end of this podcast okay. um, for both intended parents and egg donors. Great. They can both go on there great. and have a look, right? Great. Sure. Brilliant. Amazing. I think the thing I would like to just say again is that as the intended parent, you're a project manager. There's a lot of moving parts. You really have to find somebody that you feel comfortable working with that okay. you can pick up a phone and call of. Okay, so I've gone online, I've, I've registered in, in, into your website, which is great. What then happens from, say I'm an intended parent that I've signed up, what would then happen from your perspective to me? You can expect that we, will, we would write to you within 24 hours to try to set up a call and discuss your donor criteria and walk you through the process in terms of what to expect, what the timelines look like, and just give you the thought that it, this is a, a process with a lot of moving parts. And it's great to find some connection with the people you're working with. We take care of a lot of the moving parts. You will still need to take care of the surrogacy and of uh, several other moving parts. But we just want you to know that we're available. We're available for your questions, your concerns. And I give everybody my phone number. And my phone is usually very close to me. So... Yeah, I can see it right now. <laughs> Thankfully, it's probably turned off. It's but it, not. It's not. <laughs> but everybody's asleep in the US. <laughs> which is good. But I think that's really important to know as an intended parent that you have, again, you've got people on your side. You've got confidence in the team around you. They are giving you answers to questions you didn't know to ask. And I think from in all the years that I've known you, it's been phenomenal to learn from you and I'm hoping that a lot of people in this podcast are able to get some of what you've taught me. So I just want to say a huge thank you from us here at IVF Daddies and the wider community for everything that you're doing and have done. Please just keep being amazing. Thank, thank you so you, much. Richard. Thanks so much for having me. Thank you.